Thank you so much, ma'am. It's indeed an honor uh, to be here today. And um, this is not the usual audience that we speak to. We generally speak to lawyers, law students, because uh, that's where we talk about dispute resolution. So this is a new audience for me. Uh, so I had to do a lot of homework in terms of construction sector before I came and uh, came here and spoke to any of you. So I can assure you that as far as possible, I have read into construction contracts and all the trends in construction contracts recently. So I just wanted to briefly give you an overview and outline as to what we will be looking at today. Because at the very outset, I realized that for some of y'all, uh, it must have been uh, quite a question as to why are we talking about dispute resolution as engineers and what exactly can a lawyer tell us in this regard. So just to give you a brief uh, outline as to the agenda. Sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so first we will uh, try to understand the nature of a dispute because although we talk about disputes all the time, sometimes we forget to really talk about what a dispute actually is. So we will briefly look at that and then let's try to understand basic differences and characteristics of different types of uh, dispute resolution methods. Now, I know that in construction contracts, you're mostly aware of adjudication, arbitration, because those are the two main methods that you use when it comes to construction contracts. However, during today's session, I also want to emphasize how negotiation, mediation, conciliation come into this picture and what are the ways in which we can bring those methods in in our contracts. Next, Let's look at the legal framework when it comes to construction dispute resolution. So let's look at the CEDA Act and also the standard bidding documents that are there under CEDA. And I also want to take a look at FIDIC 2017 contracts, the, the forms that we have, the books that you look at. And then I also thought to have a brief look at JCT and also uh, NECs because I realized I had, a, I had some interactions with uh, quantity surveyors and contractors recently uh, because there are a lot of discussions going on on the revival of construction industry. So these are some of the contracts that they spoke about and said they are, these are the contracts that we can look at and learn from. So I tried to go through those contracts as well in terms of dispute resolution and how best we can incorporate those novel trends into our system when it comes to dispute resolution. In discussing all of this, we will also look at the role of an engineer in the dispute resolution process because different people have different roles when it comes to dispute resolution. A lawyer's role in this process is quite different from what a quantity surveyor would do. And that is different from what an engineer would do. So from the research that I did and from people that I spoke to with regard to the role of an engineer, what I understood, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you are this vital third pillar when it comes to a construction contract. You have your employer, you have the contractor, and you are that uh, pillar that cannot go missing, who would at one time act as the agent of the employer, but at the same time, who would have to act as that neutral third party who makes fair and unbiased decisions to make the contract go. So you have a lot on your shoulders other than the mathematical duties that you do that somebody who's looking at an engineer from an outside would think I, an engineer is a person who deals with numbers all the time. But from what I understood, you do a lot more than that. Dispute resolution is one of them, one of those most difficult tasks that you deal with in, in a construction. So if I have got all of that right, I hope I'll be able to share with you some important insights as to all these key areas that I am hoping to cover with all of you today. But there will be a bit of a difference. Um, I am not very much in favor of uh, one-way lecturing. So uh, you will have to work with me 
and I'm going to learn from you uh, because you are the subject expert in the area. So what I can tell you is I can throw some ideas at you. You can tell me whether you are in confirmation of those or whether you disagree, and then we, will, we can build a discussion on that. So to start with, I have a question for all of you. What is a dispute? Now, from what I understand, you deal with disputes from the start of a contract till the end and even after you build a building. For many years, after many years, a dispute can come with regard to whatever that you have built and you have supervised, right? So I think we have given you a small booklet with a file. So in that, it's a notebook. If you can take a piece of paper from that book or on the book itself, I want you to draw something that comes to your mind when you think of a dispute. I do this exercise with a lot of uh, uh, people, including law students, lawyers of different seniority. So I have seen how uh, people look at disputes. So let's see how engineers look at disputes. So I, I just want you to draw something that comes to your mind. Uh, that would explain what a dispute is like. I'm sure most of you would be able to draw very nicely, though I am not a really good artist. But don't worry about the quality of the art. Just putting your thought would be sufficient. It's best if you don't write any words. I generally tell lawyers not to do that because lawyers are very, you know, pros in writing like pages and pages and pages. So that's why I say to draw something, just a small thing. Okay, if you're done, um, I have to again now trouble you to explain what you have drawn. So I will just do a random picking, okay? And I want you to help us understand how that picture explains a dispute. Uh, I'll try to explain it to those who are uh, joining virtually. Yeah. Um, can I trouble you, ma'am? If, if, have you drawn? Yes? No? <laughs> okay. Can I trouble you, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, the letter from my friend, my but mm -hmm. Can I get the paper, please, so that our virtual participants can also see the picture? So uh, this is what the picture is. It's one part is, yes, the contractor is giving a paper term termination of contract and the employer is saying that it is not termination. All right, thank you very much. So I think this is a depiction of the experiences that you have in terms of construction industry as to start of a dispute. If we break it down further, this is where one party feels that there is a termination, whereas the other party feels that there is not. So if you take it in simple terms, this is a disagreement on opinions or perspectives. When I look at the existing circumstances, one party feels that this contract cannot be continued, therefore you have to terminate it. Other party thinks, no, it should not be, or rather other party would take up a very legal technical argument saying, your document does not amount to a termination per se. Right? Okay, thank you very much. I will trouble one more or two more people, maybe. 
I apologize for just pointing out from what you're wearing only because I don't know your names. Can I trouble you, Miss? No. Maybe you can pass the picture and I'll try to understand what it is. Maybe you can tell me whether I have done it. You didn't draw. Okay, okay. Ma'am, can I trouble you, please? Yeah, you can even come here. Well, this is. Uh... Yeah, can we show it to them? Yeah, maybe it's this. Uh, no, what, what this dispute is, uh, according to the contract documents, uh, there, there are uh, limitations. What are the boring depth? We have to go inside the prop, right? But people it, try to interpret it in such a way that they will go for, from the cutoff point, they have to go another depth, but they, I, now I am not much, uh, I can't remember exactly the figure, mm -hmm. but there is a dispute in that decision. So mm -hmm. this is what I want. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. So that once again is, I think, a point on interpretation. People have their own interpretations and according to each person's interpretation, you have disputes arising. Do we have any volunteers so that I don't have to point out, but somebody who wants to? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain, please? Yeah. The mainly uh, dispute, uh, there are three parties in a project that is engineer. The employer is the required person and the uh, engineer is the person who designed it and the contractor. The dispute between these three parties because of what is one is the money or the cost, another one is the time, another one is the standard and regulations and every specs and everything. Mm -hmm. So I try to summarize it like this. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So that's that's where when all all parties are in dispute, what is at stake? Your time is at stake. Your uh, wealth is at stake. And you are constantly troubled to follow rules and regulations. So all these things are at stake when you're at a dispute. So what I wanted to actually get from this exercise is to understand how you perceive disputes. Now, if I am to tell you now, I told you that I do this exercise very often. So I'm sure you're now wondering, okay, what, what are the things that lawyers do, right? So I, I, really, I share this uh, particular thing that a group of young lawyers we train junior lawyers. So a group of young lawyers did, uh, when I did this training once, they said, disputes are like a tuba ice cream. Have you had tuba ice cream? No? It's, it's um, it generally comes, the tuba ice cream that I have had, is the most famous and the first one that came was Faluda. Faluda tuba. It has two flavors, but if you just look at it without its cover, it's pink and it looks like it's either strawberry or faluda. But you have to eat it to see, when you take a bite, you can feel that in the middle, there is a vanilla layer. So they thought that disputes are like a tuba ice cream. What do you think? Do you think that's right? Yes or no? Yes. Why do you think so? Two yes, two different opinions. So that's one way of looking at it. What else? So instead of chocolate cake today, if I ask uh, Engineer Himal, Mr. Himal to bring uh, two by screens for all of you today, but we give it to you without the cover. Right? If he gave you a pink color ice cream without telling you what it is, then how many of you all will take it and eat it? A yeah, simple question because some people don't like faluda or strawberry, right? But some love vanilla. But when you look at the ice cream, you wouldn't know that there is vanilla. Right? So you might sometimes take it and eat. If you are a hater of vanilla ice cream, 
the moment you realize there's vanilla in it, you will be like, oh, I don't want to eat this. Right? So why did that group of young lawyers say that disputes are like a tuba ice cream is because sometimes when you look at a dispute, what you can see from the outside is not what is there in inside, right? Disputes come out or are expressed in different forms, like just like this letter of termination. It will come out as a termination letter, which will, if you try to deal with that letter, it's simply a letter of termination saying, okay, we can't work. We have to terminate it under what hardship or force major or whatever clause they will say we have to terminate. You have not made payments for this long. Hey, therefore, you have violated substantial amount of your obligations. Fundamental breach of contract, we are terminating. Those are the legal terms that will come with that. But sometimes when you look at the dispute, when you go into the dispute, you will realize that well, it's not really that, but sometimes it might be the ego of the contractor. Very high ego, doesn't want to listen to the engineer at all. You know, always fights with the engineer. Doesn't take engineer's word, you know, at all. Always doubts the engineer's impartiality and wants to get into trouble. So now he's, instead of resolving that, he is now coming and giving a letter of termination to the employee and saying, look, I can't continue this. But if you look at it, what has happened is over a period of time, he has been, you know, has having trouble with the engineer or something. Just an example. But I'm sure you must have experienced that kind of situations. Because when it, particularly I, I have heard of things like when you have very big contractors, sometimes it's very difficult to convince them on your advice or instructions that come from the engineer, right? So it can be situations like that. So internationally, uh, people uh, who talk about dispute resolution say that disputes are like an iceberg. Okay. Why is that? Once again, in an iceberg, there is a part that you can see and a part that you can't see. Right? What happens when you don't see that bottom part? What happens is what happened to what? Now, it's, I'm, there was a disaster that was caused because somebody didn't see the bottom part. Yes, Titanic, right? What happened was they thought the top part was, they calculated the, the distance towards the iceberg by looking at the top part of the iceberg. They completely disregarded the fact that there can be a bottom layer that you can't see, which might be closer to the ship, right? So the bottom part can be either very big or completely different from size, nature, everything to the top part. So similarly in disputes, there can be a part that you can't see, not can be, there is often a part that you can't see, neglection of which can lead to disastrous consequences. If you just look at the top part and try to address the top part, you might be left with a disaster in the end, just like what happened to Titan, right? So that's why it's important for us to first know as people who are engaged in dispute resolution that not every dispute comes to you as it is with all its characteristics. Nobody brings to you a dispute and says all about it. Because all what you will see is what? Uh, a disagreement, uh, notice of disagreement, dissatisfaction in no need, right? You just see that it might be, it might come with a lot of technical terms, but you might not know anything more than that. This is very much, um, I mean, this example relates a lot to lawyers because when clients come to lawyers, they come and sit and they start talking. Now, none of this happens to you, I think. But in your case, mostly it's a technical matter that will come, right? But uh, let's say your clients or the contractor comes to you and says, brings a um, extension of time claim and then tells you, um, I mean, so, 
Tiranani say make a karand ban and then Mitchell Prashna Tiana make a Pabugan that ban, all of that, and might give you a justification, but he might not tell you all the things. Right? He's always going to give you the picture that he wants you to see. Right? Not the picture that should be shown to you. So if you just if, if you are not aware of this fact very well, sometimes it can lead to disastrous consequences. Sometimes you might just decide, okay, I'm going to approve it. Or sometimes you might decide, okay, I am not. It's Whether it's this way or the other, if we are not aware of the side that we can't see, it can be disastrous. So first thing in dispute resolution is dispute diagnosis. That is where we understand the part that we can't see. This part can have so many things. Personalities, historical developments, like I said, for, for a long time you might have had problems. And now at a point, like for a very silly matter, suddenly there's a big problem. Nobody can understand as to why this man is taking such a harsh stance for this small thing. Right? But it's not very small when you really look at the historical development of the events. It can be simply egos. It can be simple fear. Because of fears, people take extreme measures. Now, I think even like recently we see that uh, some of the, some internet. Just immediately they were thinking of stopping these things in uh, end of year and now they are suddenly stopping in no, end of February we are stopping. Right, that's all what they say. And everyone is in trouble. Right, so there can be so many reasons behind these decisions that we really don't see. Okay, so it's very important for us to first understand this part that we cannot see. Now, my question to you is, how do you do that? Oh, it's not as hard as the math that you deal with. Okay. Uh, it's, it's actually a process of questioning, but not Questions that we as lawyers ask in the courthouse, in cross-examination, not that type of questions. Generally, you can get to the bottom of a problem. See, that's in colloquial language we say, no, I'll get to the bottom of that. It's the bottom of this that we talk about all the time. You know, without knowing it, we say that, no, I'll get to the bottom of that problem. So you just have to keep asking open-ended questions. Right? Why do you really think that this contract cannot be heard? taken forward. In your opinion, what is stopping this? Right? So let people talk about it a lot more because papers will not carry everything. Papers oftentimes carries half. The full part you have to extract. And that doesn't come out even in general adjudication or arbitration. It doesn't come out because you always work on this top part, positions. But if you really want to get to the bottom of it, you have to ask these open-ended questions and then identify the part that you can't see. That is where we talk about dispute diagnosis. Only when you know what this dispute is really about, you can decide the type of method that you want to use to resolve this dispute. Okay. Uh, now, if I want to stop here, I know now in your mind, so many questions are piling up. One, how can we do that? I mean, in the contract already, the dispute resolution clause is there. Now, what is she talking about? How can we decide after diagnosis? Okay, I know all of it is there. Let me slowly come to that. But I'm just giving you the ideal situation. Whatever it is, you have to first do the dispute diagnosis. Okay, identify whether it's a dispute that is arising out of data. Now see, these are causes to a conflict. There can be so many types of reasons for a conflict. Most of the times in construction disputes or anything that involves mathematics or data, it, it would come as a data conflict. It can either be lack of information. There might be things that you know, 
employer knows contractor doesn't contractor knows subcontractor doesn't know right so information has not not passed especially when it comes to variation right sometimes the variation request has gone and uh, the contractor has done some variations and informed the engineer engineer's approval has not gone now the payment is delayed so things in between communication numbers information so there can be so many different types of reasons but if you do the diagnosis properly you can identify it. now imagine if there is no there can be conflicts where it at the very outset looks like a number matter mathematical issue but when you really look at it it might be a simple miscommunication but if you try to handle the numbers at the very outset leaving out miscommunication you're just leaving space for the next problem next problem and the next problem because you have not addressed the bottom of the problem okay so it's very important to do the dispute analysis identify the causes for the conflict that you're dealing with okay now once again we come to the point how do we do that as engineers because this is not where your process starts right your process starts at a different place okay so um, we will go through these few things quickly because we are going to get to the most important parts thereafter now this thomas kilman model is a model that was introduced by thomas and kilman who did some research on disputes as to how as humans we deal with disputes it will help you to also understand some of the new additions to dispute resolution mechanisms in the construction industry all right so this is how generally people handle disputes now we know of the normal scenario from even when we went to schools our parents used to normally tell us koyari gaha ganna nam pattevat yanne pa apo herla enne right to avoid not to get into disputes when you can sense a dispute just leave it right now i want you to keep this part in mind because we are going to talk about the dispute avoidance boards the concept that they have now uh, introduced into construction disputes specially that's a new concept so to avoid disputes altogether not to let disputes happen when you sense it you do something and you not let the dispute take place you know to mature as a dispute then there is also a situation where we are very accommodating aneva monawa karakkamanne i am okay you know mostly in relationship disputes we see one party is very accommodating until some time till that party kind of gives up completely right so you can either be very accommodating in a dispute you also have the other extreme where you compete that is what happens in arbitration and litigation you compete on your stance you would say no i cannot give you an extension of time you have to pay cost for the delay there is no extension it was not approved your situation cannot be justified you have to pay the charges that we are imposing on you for the delay right and the other part will say no we are entitled to this extension of time because of these these reasons in that other project that engineer approved that under the same circumstances why can't you do it right so you have two different positions people are competing on their own justifications mostly happens in adjudication arbitration litigation this is what happens you try to prove your position then you have a place of compromising now i want you to tell me what is better compromising or collaborating compromising is better any other opinions anybody who thinks that collaboration is better than compromise what is collaboration what's what is com compromise what's the difference yes give, give and take is compromise Yeah, 
in a way yes yeah. so i will take that in a way part because in compromise both parties give up on something to have something right i will give this to have this you give that to have that right so both parties have a sense of loss they both feel that we gave up on something but we had to do it to safeguard this collaboration is different collaboration is where you don't really focus on the loss you focus on the gain and you try to come up with a solution that will be much more when you compare your loss against your gain so a collaborative effort you would not feel like you have lost now i'll take a very simple example this is a question to you once again now let's assume i i assume that most of the people who are here would have kids at home at least most right even if you're thinking of having kids just take this example and think of a few chances let's say has any any of you all heard the orange example earlier anybody yeah i know one person uh, okay maybe you you have to now keep your mouth shut without saying anything others you don't know right okay so let's assume uh, there's an orange on this table and you all your kids are here now i take one parent up and let's assume you have two kids a daughter and a son now both of them are saying they want the orange daughter is saying i went with you to the shop and i showed you this orange and then you brought it i carried the bag and brought this home this is my orange son is saying it just true she brought the bag in in the car but i got out of the vehicle carrying that bag i am the one who put it in the fridge if i didn't put it in the fridge it would have rotten nobody would have been able to eat it so i saved the orange i preserved it therefore it's mine now i want you to tell me how will you resolve this dispute now this is far easier than your construction disputes okay you will cut the orange into two and give will they be happy now why they have half no why would they be not happy they wanted the whole orange orange and now they are concentrating on the loss right what do they know i only got a half she also got a half she doesn't deserve that half and the sister would think the same thing right why did you give him a half he doesn't deserve that half that's my half right now everybody sees a half but this is exactly what we do in the formal justice system that is called distributive justice you make sure everyone has something or you go with the standard principles of justice you divide it in half that's a very standard idea right when two people are fighting for something we think dividing it in half is the best way right even if you go to a court house or arbitration most of the times they would go on this objective criteria to make a decision on that two people fighting for it what is the most uh, recognized way of doing this they would go on that that's what we also did with the orange now for that any other answers keeping in mind what we did at the very beginning of this session now is there a dispute with between the two yes now can you see the whole dispute yes now this is a test to see how well you understood the first part of the session there can be other oranges okay in this hypothetical scenario no other oranges you can't afford two oranges these days just one yeah, tell them to negotiate tell them to negotiate not capable of doing that exactly now remember we knew that in a dispute you don't see the entire dispute but you only see half of it so you need to first do the dispute diagnosis you have to get to the bottom of it right but we made a pre judgment we thought it's just a dispute what more can be there right 
we always do that we make a prejudgment that there is nothing other than this but technically what you should like he very well said is to understand why do they want this orange in the first place right if you want to give a good dance a good solution to them okay now there are two types of answers to this question when the parent asks the daughter and son why do they want first scenario this is the scenario that is taught in harvard uh, program of negotiation uh, the daughter would say i want to make a pudding the son would say i am thirsty i want to have a orange juice now how will you divide the orange exactly now for that you need to first know how to make a pudding with orange how do you make pudding with orange you need the zest you just need the peel for that you don't need the pulp for the juice you need the pulp so you get the on entirety of the peel to the daughter go and make the pudding use as much as zest you want titta ma titta vela yan hari zest da ganna athi taran denawa entire peel for the son who wants the juice take the entirety of the pulp have they lost anything no is there a sense of loss at all no they got what they want but had we gone on to give a decision without knowing why they want it what have we caused wastage of resources person who wants the drink would use that half the pulp and make a drink and throw away that other peel which the daughter could have used son could have very well used the other pulp that the daughter is going to just throw away because now they are angry at each other they are never going to give that other half even if they get to know that the other person will benefit from it. that's the nature of humans once you lose once you are never going to give up right so that is why it's important to do the dispute diagnosis well before so that you can come up with the best form of decision that will give both parties a winning solution without a compromise now that's an easy scenario when this scenario was given i was thinking to myself oh that's easy they want two different things now now what if they both want juice now how will you resolve the dispute now trust me again this is the easiest kind of dispute you can ever get now they both want juice you have one orange we can even give the opportunity to virtual participants if you all have answers please do type it in i will uh, share it you can type it on the chat if you have answers don't know what to do ah there's an answer okay sorry what's the question yeah so <laughs> <laughs> so now both kids if you heard the previous part now both kids want orange there's one orange both kids want the orange and both are saying they want juice how will you resolve this problem dilute the juice okay wait okay what do you mean by dilute just two kids two cups sure Exactly. So, uh, Mr. Hamas, right? Yeah. So he 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 gave the answer. In fact, I wouldn't say dilute, but if you just take it, like uh, so, you said, without dividing the orange itself, you value add to the orange. If the mother takes the orange, make a juice out of it. What do you do? you squeeze the orange 
you can add some water like he says dilute okay you can add some water maybe mothers put some you know lime into it a little bit of salt if you want a little bit of sugar and make a nice juice out of it then you have enough to give them both they are both getting the same juice is there a wastage no wastage but if you divide it in half and give the both of them to make their own juice will they be happy they won't be now remember orange oranges no matter how hard you try to cut it in half one in one part the peel might be thicker than the other part okay you never know you might try to do justice but justice might not be there right but if you value add it and then divide that will give you a better outcome where nobody will feel as if they lost something that is collaboration you address their needs in a creative manner you have to do a little bit of thinking to come up with that solution now why did i do this part for all of you is because as engineers you are the masterminds of that contract right that's why you are one of the three pillars holding the construction project without you it can't go forward right regardless of who else is there so it's your brain that will know best ways of resolving certain disputes some creative solutions you will be able to think of things that others will never be able to think of right but your brain can do that only if you give you give your brain that opportunity cuz we are often closed we are blind to it even this orange example not not that we never knew that you can make orange out of uh, juice out of an orange no but to think that it will be a solution it takes a little bit of opening up we have to first be open to our own creativity we have to first know that we are people who are capable of finding solutions the moment we restrict ourselves we rely on a third party to give us answers now our culture particularly the asian culture is as such we have been trained to rely on a third party kodikale when uh, two kids fight in the class what do our parents tell us to do or what do you say of kids they okay, either avoid or no let's say somebody hits your son or daughter okay. that is real wow that's that's amazing if you say that but do we say that tell the teacher that's the that's what we say right we always want people or even ourselves to rely on somebody to give us a solution now if you look at adjudication is that what we do arbitration is that what we do litigation is that what we do yes sometimes we go to arbitrators who have never even set a foot to a construction site and we ask them to resolve a construction dispute right and sometimes they don't understand what a sbd is sometimes they might not understand the very basic mathematics that you do when you just look take a glance at it you know what it is right they might not understand so you might have to call for expert witnesses who go explaining everything that you are taught in the first year of engineering faculty right applies to me as well i am a lawyer i wouldn't know anything about your mathematics right some concepts now i am not saying that judges or who don't have this experience can't hear these cases i'm not saying that what i'm saying is we are very comfortable relying on other people to give us solutions right even if you go on facebook everyone comes and put all their problems there and ask please somebody help me asking help is not bad please don't misinterpret but what i am saying is we have not been trained to think for think of solutions has have our parents ever asked us when we are in a dispute or a problem okay what do you think is the solution have they ever asked us or do you even ask your kids do you ask them do you know the solution what do you think can be the solution oh we don't because we think they are 
incapable. And we think we are incapable of finding solutions. So this part is only to tell you that we all have that capability. And you being the masterminds of contracts, construction particularly, you have that ability. When I do this training for commercial entities, we tell them they are the business people, right? They are business minds. They are the best people to find best solutions for their businesses because it's your thing. You know how to get out of it, right? So first, once you do the dispute diagnosis, parallel to that, tell yourself that I know how to find solutions. At least I can try. Failing, go to an expert. It's okay. I'm not saying don't do that ever. But starting point, try to do that. Okay. Okay, so then we come to the technical part. Now we have, we know, do the dispute diagnosis, be ready to collaborate, not always compromise. Don't think about resolving. Settlement means compromise. That's a myth. Settlement doesn't always mean compromise. It can be collaboration. Join, hold hands together, walk towards a solution that gives you a lot more than give and take. It can be a completely new solution like making juice, the mother making the juice. Okay, now we come to different methods that are available for you to resolve your disputes. First one, as you all know, it's negotiation. Negotiations can happen in two ways, formal and informal. Informal one will not involve lawyers most of the times. It might not sometimes even involve yourself as engineers. It might simply go between the employer and the contractor in certain instances when it's heavily on business concepts or something like that. It might also involve you that can still be a negotiation, right? However, the most important thing in negotiation is you are the decision maker. You decide whether you want to settle or not. It's your game. You decide the terms. Okay. Yeah. You decide whether you are going to settle. If so, on what terms are you going to settle? Now, in a negotiation, most important thing is that you prepare a negotiation strategy. Now, one thing to know is we do go for negotiations. You all, obviously, you have all been part of so many settlements in your career. But how often have you prepared for a negotiation properly? Have you ever discussed a negotiation strategy? Now, this might not apply to your role as, let's say, a project engineer, because sometimes you might not take a side, right? But if you are advising a particular contractor on something in a consultancy capacity from that contractor's side, or if you're advising an uh, employer, not as the project engineer, but in any other capacity, you might have to become a part of negotiations and take a side, not be a neutral. Okay, now let's make that clear. Not as the project engineer who has to be neutral, but as an engineer who advises to either of the two parties in employer or the contractor, then you have to have a negotiation strategy. Now, how do you come up with a negotiation strategy? We generally do a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis, all of you must be knowing, it's a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis in that particular dispute. Parallel to a dispute diagnosis, you do a SWOT analysis. Then you identify your BATNAs and BATNAs. What is a BATNA? BATNA is a best alternative to your negotiated segment. Before you go to the negotiation, you need to know what would be my best alternative. If you don't have a best alternative, you are weak in your negotiation because you can't walk out of it. You're scared. If this fails, you don't know what else to do. So to face a negotiation with a strong footing, you need to first identify what your partner is. You go to the negotiation thinking, okay, I need to get an outcome that is better than my partner. If not, I am not settling. 
you know that's your top point if the settlement is worse than your batna you have to walk out you can't sign that agreement because you have a better alternative okay so that's why for a negotiation batna is important then you need to know what your batna is that's your worst alternative obviously your settlement has to be a lot better than your batna okay next thing we also learn a concept i haven't put all of those here but i will just give you the overview so that you know what to go and maybe do some further reading on there is something called malatna m l a t n a malatna is the um it's it's where most likely agreement to a negotiated settlement that's like that's very similar to the concept of zopa that's zone of possible agreement when you draft your strategy you can circle a particular area and say like we do in venn diagrams or venn circles and the like yani menna me area eke thamai mage settlement ekak tiyenne wage you have to come up with a possible zone then you will know how to generate options me area eke thamai me settlement ekak yenne mokada ara patta kiyata wat me kala in karanne then him you can come up with a measurement no these people are never going to give up on this aspect this is a vital interest for them so you have to first identify your interests their interests my positions their positions my weakness their weakness my strength their strength my opportunity their opportunity so a spot is not only for you you have to do a spot for them then set each party's interest and then see what's the zopa is then where can you place your creative options if your creative options fall within that zopa then you have won more than half the game because when you go to the negotiation table and drop these offers that are actually in the zopa other party can't reject because your option really addresses their interest that's why it falls within the zopa Z Z zone of possible agreement. Okay, so these are the things that we have to strategize on. I apologize, I can't take more time on this, but I have just thrown in all the concepts that are relevant in the area, so you can do further readings on that. Next thing is mediation. Now this is, we think we are very familiar about it because of the Samata Mandali. I promise that I will clarify this. now first clarification that i want to make is mediation is not samatha mandale media samatha mandale is only a place where they are supposed to use mediation internationally there are community mediation practices community mediation is samatha mandale where you get a free mediation service now first disclaimer is in sri lanka you don't see a proper mediation practice in samatha mandale this is accepted across from i know of supreme court justices who agree with this stance because in sri lanka what we see is a mixed method a hybrid method of mediation and conciliation when it comes to samatha mandala so what happens in mediation it's a facilitated negotiation it's actually a negotiation decision making power is with the parties parties have control over everything but there is a neutral third party who helps you negotiate third party mediator cannot make decisions in a mediation mediator can't tell the parties are ah, you do this he can't give his own ideas Okay, there is a very thin line. Actually, it's not thin between that and conciliation. So, negotiate mediation is a facilitated negotiation where the mediator only facilitates the process. Now, you might think, what is that? Is there anything to do? Of course, there is. Negotiations often times fail when there is no neutral third party because negotiations can come into an impasse because of egos. communication gaps and inability to focus 
because when we start a negotiation two parties you can talk about everything irrelevant but what is relevant and you can't ask the other party we have to focus because then they get mad and their egos get hurt and you know so there are a lot of politics in a negotiation like that you need a third party to tell you okay calm down we need to now focus this is where we are let's take it like this let's be respectful and ask questions to help you focus and go through a process till the end that is what a mediator does not tell you what to do and what not to do as to the resolution okay so there's high party autonomy settlement agreement now we often hear that our mediations binding our mediation settlements binding no what are the cases uh huh mm. yeah that also doesn't say that anybody who would say yes uh huh mm. no actually that's not what that act also says but the answer is there in this slide what happens in a mediated settlement agreement at the end of a mediation what do you do sure. so if you agree on some set settlement terms you sign an agreement is it binding or not is it binding okay so well, how is it binding it's an agreement now i don't say anything why you did i mean yes you said no because that is what we have been taught at the very outset in any of the dispute resolution not trainings actually even at law faculty the first time when i learned the module what was taught was mediation is not binding but that's wrong mediated settlement agreements are binding as much as a contract because it's an agreement between two parties so long as yes no that's a contract actually it is as good as your construction contract it has the same value of that contract so long as it is not vitiated by factors such as misrepresentation for fraud duress then eva thiyena nan construction contract ekat valid nahi construction contract ekata contractual validity ekata relevant when all six principles in capacity legality of acceptance consideration e tika thiyena wana mediated settlement agreement is a contract but this was a myth that has been there for quite a long time in sri lanka uh, so i even published a paper on that as to how it becomes a contract and the academia agreed with, on that not only because the academia agreed even the court of appeal justices uh, have given judgments on that saying uh, under the civil procedure code there is a provision which says you can settle so when settling also what happens is you come into a settlement agreement so the justices say when you have settled it has the same value of a binding contract once you agree to settle you can't go back and say ah oh, it was just a settlement i didn't know you can't say all of that if you agree to settle on certain things you have agreed you are bound by it difference is whether these agreements are directly enforceable or not now these agreements are binding as a contract enforceable as a contract so the settlement agreement is not directly enforceable in sri lanka till now but the mediation act is in being drafted right now so we hope that it will also come in if you take the singapore singapore mediation act says once you settle you have to simply take the settlement agreement give it to court and say i want you to enforce these these clauses court will issue a decree on it there is a law for that so and there is now un 
convention on mediation which enforces the internationally mediated contracts just like the new york convention for arbitration so mediation has gained that popularity and those agreements are and can be enforceable they are binding so do not get scared to go for mediation people get scared thinking they are not binding so what's the use of it right that's wrong if you are to be careful in signing your contract when it comes to a construction fearing that i will be legally bound you have to have the same fear when you sign a settlement agreement that's why mediation is important that's why you have to go prepared for that negotiation okay now how it happens in general is parties are represented with lawyers in mediation now in samatha mandale oka venne samatha mandale act itself leave the lawyers out but international level and professional mediation level you go with your lawyer if you want if uh, uh, your engineer whoever your technical expert because at the at the negotiation table you have to decide on your interests your liabilities your capacity everything right so it's a big process it's not a subtle process that's what i wanted to emphasize it is a process that carries legal validity then these acts mediation boards act mediation special categories act those two apply to samatha mandala community mediation construction industry development act that see that act that you know section 50 says parties may if they can't settle it on their own refer to mediation by mediation or conciliation by the authority so the authority has the power to provide mediation conciliation services so if you want to you can go and get those services from the authority i think himal and then my looking at giving those services from the authority uh, but one thing that i want to clarify is that act is very clear on me it's an option for you it's not compulsory so if somebody thinks we, if we are to mediate we have to go through the ceda that's not correct it's an option if you take a closer look at ceda act every other section professional person shall register it's all the all those things are shall 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 those are compulsory requirements that it sets up but this they specifically use the word may if the party so wish i think that's the reading so it clearly gives the parties the autonomy because mediation is technically a voluntary process you can decide who your mediator should be where do you want to do your mediation all of that so it's party autonomy okay uh then even if you take sbds i will go to that later we'll finish this first then you have commercial mediation act this act though it came in 2000 sri lanka is very famous for this uh this center was never set up there were so many attempts by uh leading professionals like mr dara vijay tilak and all of them and chamber of commerce to set up this center but they couldn't do it because of several inefficiencies in the act itself so the act is there no center uh companies act also recognize part 20 specifically companies disputes to be resolved through mediation so i just wanted to tell you how important and what type of importance sri lankan law has given to mediation because we term sometimes look down on it. we think ah oh, it's not a proper process it's not binding that's not true then in mediation there are also concepts like judicial mediation where the judge mediates we also have this concept concept in sri lanka sri lankan court of appeal supreme court mediation rule uh, there is a supreme court rule which says court of appeal can me mediate appeal matters judges to sit as mediators court of appeal judges can sit as mediators and in court of appeal they can mediate rule came in 1990 once again still not happening but the rule is there and actually now the judges are looking into this because all around the world canada high level of success in appeal mediation by judges so that is happening in the world singapore special judges are trained in this subject 
Court annex mediation is another concept where the courts themselves refer matters for mediation. I don't want to emphasize on all of this because that's more or very much relevant to lawyers. Um, but just to know that mediation is important. Okay, then we come to conciliation. Most important thing is to understand the difference between mediation and conciliation. Like I said, the line between mediation and conciliation is conciliator has a power of decision making. Mediator does not have a power of decision making. So that's why even in CEDA, you have the two terms, mediation or conciliation. So you have to make the decision very carefully. Do I want a third party who can make decisions or do I want myself to make decisions? Do I only want a facilitator? Based on that only you decide what your method is. Okay, so that's the difference. Conciliator but can be a little bit more facilitative as well as opposed to an arbitrator or an adjudicator. Now the adjudicator will never ask you what your solution is. No? But a conciliator will. Conciliator will ask you, do you have an option? Do you think this is better? He will put some suggestions and see. But if you can't agree on any of those things, he will finally give a decision and he will try to make you agree to that. Mediator can't do those things. But I also want to stress upon the fact that in mediation also, there are different types of mediation. Evaluative mediation comes very, very close to conciliation. But th there is where you have a very thin line. Now, if you go to Singapore, Singapore construction mediators come very close to evaluative mediation. That's very close to conciliation. But they still doesn't, they don't impose the solution on you, but they bring you closer to that, very close to that. Because sometimes construction disputes can be highly technical. No? So if the mediator is only facilitating, sometimes it can be disappointing to the parties. If the, if the mediator can't show some guidance. So if the parties require the mediator to show some guidance, such mediators will come close to an evaluative mediation mode. But you still can't cross to conciliation where you impose on the parties. Okay. Uh, got the differences? Is that clear? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Generally, that's how your contract defines it. Like now, let's say the conciliation act, I have set out it here. The act says conciliated decision is binding according to the act. So it depends on under which law you're going for conciliation. If your contract says it's, it's, it's up to the parties or that you can challenge it, then it's it's not necessarily binding or final rather. But actually that is how you term it in your dispute resolution clause. Now as project engineers, you might or might not have a control over that. Sometimes if you have to go with a standard clause or if you come into the contract after the contract has been drafted and agreed upon. But for if you're an advisor to an employer who's trying to come up with a contract, then you can essentially play an advisory role and say, look, this is how you have to draft this clause. Don't set to one thing. What I always encourage is to go for a mixed method. Keep it open to go for an amicable settlement at any point of time. I will show you how. Correct. So what I'm saying is not to make changes to that, but I will show you how the uh, SPD clauses actually leave you space to get into this. So, uh, all right. So in conciliation, I wouldn't go uh, to any more complexities because the most important part was explained. Then we come to adjudication. In the construction industry, you're very much familiar with this. Dispute adjudication boards, expert determinations, neutral evaluation. Whatever the name you call it, ultimately what happens is there is a third party expert 
to whom you make submissions, then that expert gives you a decision. Again, based on the law under which you are going for this, it can be final, it can be not final. Right? There are certain laws, I mean, even the CEDA, even SBT is what tells you is within 28 days, if you don't challenge it through arbitration, that becomes a final and binding decision. Correct? So that's again how the term has been, how, how that uh, dispute resolution clause is worded and where this is placed. Okay. Uh, since you are very much aware about this, I'm not going to explain it in further. Arbitration. So that's like the last resort in construction industry, right? You don't want to go to litigation, but you try to uh, go for arbitration because arbitration and litigation is either or. You can't have both, but you finally get pushed on to litigation because if you want to get it enforced, you have to go to court either way. Now what has happened is you spend time, our, uh, years in arbitration, then you spend some more years in litigation. So the whole point of arbitration is lost. Right. So that's why once again, we encourage you to think of amicable settlement, even when you go for these processes. How? I will start with the Arbitration Act. Now, this applies to SBDs as well. All the SBDs say, if you are challenging adjudication decision, you have to go for arbitration. And the SBD also says, arbitration, the law governing arbitration, Lex Arbitri would be what? Arbitration Act of Sri Lanka, 11 of 1996. Section 14 of 11 of this act says, from the moment you initiate an arbitration, and at any point of time, you can settle the matter through mediation, conciliation, or any other method. So just because you have an arbitration clause in your agreement, it doesn't mean that you can't mediate. It doesn't mean you can't negotiate. It doesn't mean you can't consider it. So if you know this section, it's simply a matter of asking the tribunal, saying the tribunal, we want to settle this, su suspend the proceedings until we come up with a solution. Now, you don't have to do with this to all the issues. Now, in an arbitration, you raise several issues, the issue one, two, three, four, five. You can decide. Okay, why don't we negotiate issue one and three that we can negotiate? Let's arbitrate three and four. So you continue arbitration on three and four. Parallel, you go with mediating one and three. You're saving a lot of time. You don't have to lead evidence, make submissions on one and three. But once you arrive at the settlement, act says, you can submit the terms of settlement to the tribunal and tribunal has to convert it into an award. So it's as good as an arbitral award. But you get it through mediation or negotiation or conciliation or whatever the method you want. So, so you say that adjudication, when the decision was given, they can go to the court and make it final. The final system was there. Yeah. Why Sri Lanka? It is not that. So actually, that is because party autonomy is vested with the parties. Now, let's say it's a very adjudication. It's it's a process where you select a particular person and you entrust that person with making a decision for you, right? But if you are aggrieved with that, this system, you have no other person to go and complain to. That's your final place, right? Whether you agree or not. Here, the system has given you more space if you're not agreeing to go for a more rigid process where it's a fully fledged hearing. In adjudication, you don't get a full hearing like you do in arbitration or in litigation. It's mostly submissions. But once again, what I'm saying is it's actually up to you. If you are happy with it, now the UK system, if parties think that no, adjudication is sufficient, we just want to get some decision, that's fine. Right, but the law in Sri Lankan law has not codified it in such a way that you make it final. But it see the things that it can be made final, and if parties are happy with that, that's a different thing. But it has to come into your agreement because ultimately contracts are what's the ultimate document? It's your contract, right? It's up to parties, parties' autonomy. So you, if you decide that this is the best way, 
adjudication shall be final between the parties. It's actually up to parties, right? The whole reason why you go to arbitration is I think in personal views because you get a fully fledged hearing thereafter and it's governed by law in a very strigid, rigid process, right? You have a law governing your arbitration, there are rules, then you have a process of enforcement. But now like uh, Mr. Ima said, if there is a process, direct process of enforcement, actually some people prefer that because then you can't challenge it. But drafters has not thought that way. But if as industry, you think adjudicators award is as good as, I mean, it's, it's good enough to be a final decision. Actually, I think that's something maybe as an industry, you should discuss. It's up to the parties, actually. This question was, in fact, also asked from, um, uh, from one of the Supreme Court justices with whom we did a webinar also. This question was put to him. So this, this is what he also said. Actually, this is like orange. We are not satisfied. Then what do you do? If we can, we just Exactly. So that's because one person's view is not accepted. No? Because expert opinions can also vary. And it's only one person in adjudication. Whereas in arbitration, you have three people and you go with the majority. So there are so many reasons as to why it's not just adjudication that's binding, but you go for an arbitration process. And for adjudication. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so then. So then, of course, I, I mean, once again, up to the parties, that's what I you think. Standard adjudication, not practicing. It was said when you are trying to experiment, so in some particular days, we have to go for the standard execution. But what was happening in the other mm -hmm. So that's why it's like a, it's a conciliation. I think that's what where the sir said. I mean, in CEDA, the rules are pressed, the, the process of adjudication is not set out, therefore, people go for ad hoc. Not set up at, anyhow, anyhow, in the SPD2, so the procedure rule was there. But in, in practice, it was not happened because they have to pay for the educator at the beginning of the project. That's a huge cost. Then at that time, the contractor and the employer not willing to go for the educator. Yeah, and because you don't foresee a yeah. dispute. Yeah, I think this is this is the same concept that would come with dispute adjudication and avoidance boards where you have a dispute board who would come and constantly visit the site and see where, whether there's a dispute that's going to come up and then take preventive action. But for big projects, I think that's a very smart idea to do because you don't know when a dispute would come, but you obviously know there will be disputes. Uh, yes, so uh, in arbitration, what I wanted to emphasize was don't restrict yourself to one. Find the law which says that you can go and try to find the most effective way of resolving the dispute, not to restrict yourself to this one method if there is scope to go further. Lit litigation, judicial adjudication, of course, you know how it happens in courts. You have no control. Whatever the lawyer tells the judge, judge listens to it and then gives you a decision. So your role there is limited to the highest level. All what you can do is get on the witness box, say, answer the questions that are put to you. Right? So you can't do anything beyond that. So the importance of all these methods is that you understand the method that can give you the most amount of space to use your expert knowledge. And you find that method for your advantage. Now, I just went through uh, some of these contracts. So you might have to tell me whether you agree or disagree. Uh, because it's, I mean, I don't know, I really didn't find an article which put all of these things together. Uh, so SBDs 1, 2, 3, and 4, there is no direct reference to mediation, negotiation, or conciliation. Am I right? Correct. It starts with adjudication, right? If there is a dispute arising, you go for adjudication. Uh, but party autonomy in any contract is key when it comes to a dispute. So I believe you have the right to go for a supplementary agreement if you really want to mediate before you go for adjudication. Because SPD doesn't give you a time bar. 
unlike some other contract from forms where there might be a time bar saying if you have a dispute within 10 days issue notice of adjudication okay go for an adjudication issue that you have tell the other party that you have a dispute there is no time bar it doesn't tell you when to go for an adjudication i am just showing you ways okay so it doesn't stop you from negotiating when you know there is a dispute you can always start with a negotiation you can try mediation if you want to preserve a good relationship imagine it's a massive construction project in between you have a dispute now if you are to take this this dispute to adjudication and then to arbitration you are hampering your relationship with your contractor and it's going to be a nightmare to have that construction project continue till the end once you have a very bad relationship right so it's always good to attempt negotiation but from what i have been told i am told that this is the practice though it's not on paper that you always try to do it on an unofficial basis you try to negotiate right a uh, mediation to a certain informal extent but not in the proper process so i think it's always wise for us to explore this possibility because that opportunity is there you are not time bound if you are time bound then you are at a problem because whatever that you do you have to do within that time and then go for adjudication but here it doesn't time bound so you can try all of these things failing you can go for the for adjudication as the proper dispute resolution method but if you settle beforehand who's stopping you nobody will even know that you had a dispute which is a good thing right it's good for you your contractor is good for your employer your employer will love you for being that engineer who could save him from adjudication and huge costs of arbitration right i'm there see one ஒரு but always good to go for a supplement agreement like a media agreement to mediate agreement to negotiate so that at a later stage nobody can come back and say we never agreed to do that we don't know who you sat with he didn't have the authority you don't want those problems so you will put it down these are the people who will represent the employer these are the people who will represent the contractor this is, this this is the person who will be the mediator and then you do the mediation accordingly you can always go for a mediation center there are mediation centers who have mediation rules even if your arbitration clause is icc international chamber of commerce you still have possibility to mediate so this, this is what i want to tell you don't worry about the words that are in your contract only there are ways in which you can mediate you can amicably settle amicable settlement is not something illegal to do it's just that you have to find the legal way of doing it proper way of doing it selection of arbitration act i already talked about section 14 so even if there is arbitration now sbd so you start with negotiation mediation you go for adjudication if you are not happy you challenge and go for arbitration even when arbitration is ongoing if you think still there is some possibility because now everybody has spent so much money all are frustrated with a lot of time spent now they might want to settle you know you never know because i know of a case where after 20 years of an ip battle in the supreme court level they settled two big companies right after fighting for 20 years they settled so if they can settle after 20 years definitely whatever the stage because you might think ah by the time it comes to arbitration they don't want to settle no don't prejudge you never know so always put it to the parties and ask the parties if you have that ability once again not as the project engineer but maybe if you do it both parties that will be fair but don't just push one party 
uh, yeah so then sida act i told you mediation or conciliation but though it says by the authority it doesn't stop you from going for your own private mediations and conciliation okay it's an option for you because sometimes parties wouldn't know where to get it yes then go to sida to get it fidik all of you are very much familiar with it and myself but i just went through uh, the yellow book and the red book has uh, similar provisions i was told that mostly used is the red book am i right i was told <laughs> uh, so what it says essentially is it gives engineer a special role now i found this very very interesting uh because there it says clause 21 engineer is to consult with the parties to encourage them to reach an agreement so that's exactly what a mediator does this is essentially telling you that the engineer can act as the mediator because if the engineer is to act impartially if the engineer is a neutral if the engineer is to be fair for both parties engineer has all the qualities to become a mediator but i always say that it's best you get trained as a mediator accredited as a mediator because the mediation process you have to learn you have to learn the skills of a mediator and all of those things but your position is very much valuable for you to act as a mediator in this process because both parties have faith in you that's why you are given that position right if the two parties don't trust you you can't be the engineer of that project anymore right so fidic 2017 this clause essentially places you in a position of a mediator and that's the starting point and it gives you 42 days to explore this if in 42 days you can't get them to agree amicably then only you go to your determination as the engineer right so this is this i thought is a very good point for us to know as engineers you can play a role of a mediator in the dispute resolution then you have the daabs that's the newest concept which is dispute avoidance and adjudication board it has two roles one is a preventive role second one is the adjudication role the usual dispute adjudication now the avoidance part is where again the dispute disputes avoidance board has to act as a mediator they can sense a dispute coming they will bring the two parties and get them to now agree on a way to avoid this dispute parties themselves come to the decision but is the same board that will then have to adjudicate it if this is not avoided and resolved now uk there are case law to say that this dual role is contradictory i will tell you why actually the judges have also said said why so not just me saying it's because in mediation there is a rule that is called without prejudice and it's confidential okay even arbitration is confidential not so mediation confidential and there is a double confidentiality when it comes to a private session with a mediator whatever one party tells me i can't tell the other party if this party doesn't want me to tell that to the other party so it's a double confidentiality also now what happens when i mediate with them and then i also adjudicate with them all the confidential information that you shared with me i know all of them they are all in my brain when i go to adjudicate right so the without prejudice part where you say without prejudice means without prejudice to your legal rights and interests right so whatever you shared with me thinking that i will not use them against you now if i am the adjudicate i will have to use them because now i know technically i can't but obvious biases are there right so i have heard all the confidential things i might use it so the courts in the uk have already held that this is a conflicting situation you can't have both same body doing both this is exactly why i noted sbd4 says adjudicator to mediate it can't happen because when the adjudicator mediates medi it adjudicator becomes aware of all the confidential things and then he adjudicates so that goes against the basic principles of mediation so that's one concern 
then there is another amicable settlement option now see the how the process comes you have they have given you first time to again settle then another avoidance period is there again you have amicable settlement option within 28 days before challenging the adjudication decision just like here even under sbd you have 28 within 28 days challenge kenane but did we ever think that within those 28 days we can negotiate no what we do is ara davas vc at athle we draft papers and we plan for arbitration right but see here they have clearly identified that that 28 days is also for you to reconsider settlement because now we are going to end up in a big battle right but like i said even in that big battle if you want you can settle particularly under the sri lankan act you can start the battle and then also settle there is enough an opportunity for you to come in and creatively settle right only problem is we are most of the times blind to it we do not know we think it's all in the hands of our lawyers and the arbitrators and then we come back thank you so we go to their chambers file like a deal i go on consultation and you have made us regular consultation in case again the other person to do the deal we come back thinking now they have to resolve this no don't do that engage in the process from the start to the end at every possible time because you feel the pulse of the project right you know whether there's a possibility i longer to the make a method the product settle car gonna pull on now the tension is down both parties are frustrated let me try to see if we can settle you know because finishing it early is good for you all right remember it's not the same for you know lawyers finishing it early is not their interest right so you have to be aware of what your interest is now don't think i am a lawyer and talking against lawyers no for lawyers what we say is faster we can resolve disputes more the matters that come to us right more the trust we earn so it's a two way process not bad for either party good for both parties uh yeah so that's for arbitration then uh, jct and uh, nec is even in the joint contracts tribunal those contracts uh, standard bidding contracts 2016 version i think that is the latest version am i right this is what i was able to find yeah I, this is what i found the latest uh, so clause 91 says it starts with mediation how it starts is if the parties fail to amicably settle then you go for mediation so starts with mediation after a failed negotiation so if the parties can't settle then you start with a mediation then nec contracts actually they don't refer to mediation or conciliation if you look at nec's you will see that they have options w1 w2 w3 this is what i saw i'm very new to this but this is the research that i have got uh so what they say is these options have a very interesting part called senior representative i haven't gone much into see who a senior representative can be but i kind of guessed that it can be a role like an engineer who is impartial neutral and uh, is able to be fair in the process so yes so senior representative option is essentially a place where you can use mediation and negotiation because it gives the opportunity for the senior representative to see whether it can be settled in the process what the senior representative can use are these methods so these contracts might not sometimes directly tell you that whether it's mediation negotiation or conciliation but it might leave you space if it says parties to decide parties to settle remember that's an indication of party autonomy they are giving you the decision making power in the dispute resolution methods we now discussed mediation negotiation are the top two methods which gives you fullest party autonomy so you look at the wording you see whether there's party autonomy then you look at the dispute resolution methods and pick the methods which gives you that highest party autonomy 
then you see whether you can find a way in the contract to facilitate using this method. That way, you can find the most appropriate method to resolve your disputes with less cost, less time, and safeguarding the interests of your employer as well as your contractor working collaboratively. So my final point is mediation or negotiation does not have to end up in a compromise. They can end up in a collaboration so long as you put on your creative hats and use your expertise to come up with a collaborative solution that addresses the interests of all parties. Thank you very much. Ah, okay. yes. Uh, as per FIDIC 2017, engineer no need to act impartial. I, are you referring to the agent concept, is it? Saja. Sorry? Uh, hi, Saja. I, I, yes, 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 yes. So yes, I understand that. Um, that's why I said, I think the contract started where they said engineer to be an entirely impartial person. But it seems that the concept has changed over time. And now this law of agency and identifying the engineer as an agent of the con uh, employer has now surfaced. So it's there, that's why if the mediator, if the engineer is to act as a mediator, what you need is party's consent. If the parties are willing to accept you as a neutral third party, if the parties can place confidence in you to act neutral, then you can mediate. That's why I said, if whenever you're going for such an agreement, get it in writing. If before every mediation, we sign something called a mediate uh, an agreement to mediate. In that agreement, we say both parties agree to appoint this person as the mediator. So if you agree to appoint that, then no problem. But I agree with agree on this point. Without doing that, if you just automatically assume, anybody can later raise this point and say, mediator was not really impartial because he was also acting as the agent of the employer at some point, because that's true. No? You act as the agent of the employer at some point when you give instructions, right? So yes, correct. Does that answer your question, Sajjan? Yes, it Ah. Okay. Can a mediator propose suitable options? Yes. So that's why I said you have a very thin line there. If the parties request you to act in an evaluative manner, you can, but we generally do those in private sessions. Now, I was not able to tell you what the mediation process is because the time is limited. In a mediation process, you have joint sessions and private sessions. Private sessions, mediator meets with each party separately. And then you tell the, then you can just put it on the table to a party to consider. But that also, if the parties are comfortable of you doing that, so to facilitate this process, before a mediation, we conduct something called a pre-mediation conference. Before the mediation, we meet with the party separately. Generally, now it happens on a team's call or something. Then we ask them what their special needs are. So if the parties tell us, uh, look, we prefer if you can take a more evaluative and helpful approach in this process, then the mediator can take an evaluative process. But the key line is you can't impose on them. You can't tell them, ah, this is very easy matter, you know, nothing to consider. You pay him this much, you do this, you can't do that. It's up to the parties. In a private session, 
surfacing solutions if the parties are struggling with finding a way to get out, then yes. I hope that's... Uh, no, you don't sign an agreement with the mediator, but before the mediation, mediator will ask you to, the two parties to sign an agreement to mediate. Because see, mediator doesn't get himself involved in the decision process, uh, decision making process at all. But now different countries, mediation laws require different things. Now in Singapore, if you want to enforce one, it says either you have to be a certified mediator, you know, to place your signature as to the fact that you conducted that mediation or your mediation has to be conducted in a center that is recognized under the law. But now in Sri Lanka, we still don't have that. So either way, if you have a valid agreement, that's why I said when you go for a mediation or a negotiation, it's always advisable to take your lawyer with you. Because at the end of the settlement, you have to get your lawyer to draft your settlement terms. Lawyer will only know how to best draft those settlement. See, that's where we come together. You can do the thinking. You can negotiate. You can bring in the new solution. But we as lawyers help you put it into legal terms and make sure that there is no lacuna in terms of the law or legal validity of this binding contract. You know, I have witnessed this uh, mediation in Singapore. Uh, started at nine, we finished by five. Uh, the two parties came uh, with their senior lawyer, uh, junior lawyer, and an intern, two huge firms in Singapore. Uh, so after the settlement terms were agreed on, it was the job of the lawyers. They drafted then and there. This, from this sent to that agreement was emailed to that room. Then they both agreed on terms. We all got together to the one to one room, main room. There's a huge screen. On the screen, the entire agreement goes from one to start to end. Matter closed. One day. It's possible to do that. It's just that you have to follow that process. Oh. All right, okay. Um, please explain a bit about ancestral model law. That will take a bit of time, yeah. but. Yeah, maybe on another day, if there's time, I will explain on ancestral modular because it's a lot. Uh, I don't think I can just rush through it. Uh, because there are two, of course, you, you have to talk about arbitration and then or talk about mediation. So it's a lot. Uh, talking about agreements, can we sign agreements with comments, even though contractors, clients are upset on it? Being an engineer, we can't accept something wrong, knowing it's wrong. Is there any other way to face this kind of situation? No, you don't have to agree on anything if your client and contractors are upset. That's why you need to have... Now see, even this process is a negotiation. That's what we don't realize. Before you sign a contract, every communication back and forth is a negotiation. So get prepared very well for those negotiations. Don't agree on anything that you're not comfortable with. Recently, I heard a contractor saying they stopped the contract. Um, said final arbitration is at ICT. I was thinking to myself, why did you agree to it? So you have to be very careful when you agree to dispute resolution clauses, just. Now, other than that, there can be so many other clauses that you don't agree to, then don't agree. I know sometimes the employers or the contractors might push you. That's okay. It's never going to happen. You know, just get it done. They will say that. But you have to at one point set your foot down and say, well then, you know, I can't, I can't be a part to this. I am at least exempt myself from any type of liability when you get into trouble with this. So you have to make those decisions because as lawyers, we sometimes face that. We show them where it can go wrong and then they're like, you were in there or how are they in the and And then it happens, they're like, oh, it happened. So don't agree to anything if they're upset. Always, so that's why if you're trained in negotiation or mediation, you will know the techniques 
to get people to avoid that. Because even on negotiating contract terms, we often go on the positions. Uh, I don't have enough time to explain this throughout, but if we take some examples, I could tell you how to avoid such terms and rephrase and get what, what is uh, acceptable to both. So there are methods and techniques of do doing those things. I hope it helped. One, two questions have come out. Okay, uh, but shouldn't there be three-way agreement with parties and mediator, a specific basic mediation in terms? Be mediator fees. So mediator fees you agree before way before the mediation. Generally, mediators charge session fees. Very, very expensive senior mediators might charge hourly fees. Generally, it's from nine to six. They charge a session is nine to six for an entire day. That's how they block their days. It's not like arbitration, that's half a day, two, three hour sessions. We keep our days for the entire day. And then we go. So you agree on fees and fees is divided between parties. Uh, you don't have to sign anything with the mediator other than his commitment to mediate. Because if the mediator can't come and do the session the entire day, there's no point of getting him or her as a mediator. That's going to be another waste of time. But in terms of settlement terms, mediator is not going to do anything. He can't come and give evidence in court and say these people agree to do these things. Remember, it's without prejudice. It's only the two parties to give evidence and say, we, I agree to do this, I didn't do it. That's the only relationship. Because mediator didn't make decisions, you did. That's the difference. Uh, joint venture company, main company close with the court order. We have a project agreement with them. An arbitrator appointed by court. What is his duty? Decision made by him. Yes, it's arbitration. So if the court appoints an arbitrator, it means that you were not able to appoint an arbitrator by yourself. It's provided under the act. Act says if the two parties are unable to appoint an arbitrator, then you can apply to the court and court and appoint an arbitrator. But it doesn't change the process. It's the arbitration process. So the arbitrator goes through the arbitration. Uh, decision made by him. But since section 14 is there, you can ask him and get an opportunity to negotiate with the other party. You don't negotiate with the arbitrator. Negotiate with him, no. You negotiate with the other party. Act section 14 allows you to do that. With that, uh, I'll end. Thank you so much. I hope uh, there was something for you to take home and think about. Thank you so much. Thanks. So, so there, there was a one feedback form. So with the QR, uh, so I can move it. Yeah. It's clear. So you can uh, give your feedback from this lecture. So is it clear? Okay. So if you have a software, yeah. okay, it gets shared. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarani. So it's a wonderful evening and a good uh, presentation. So I cordially invite our uh, civil uh, civil Indian Sexual Committee uh, Chair. Uh, Madam Kamala Gunawardhan to uh, give the uh, token of appreciation. Sa uh, Madam Sarani, you also uh, come to the audience. So uh, the time was passed. So uh, it was my uh, privilege to uh, deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the uh, Civil Sectional Committee. Yes, uh, Mrs. Sarani, you were delivered uh, very fruitful and uh, time bounded. Uh, the topic is the mediation. I think that due to crisis and a lot of situation, the construction industry faces a lot of dispute and we are held up with those things. Uh, on this occasion, uh, I wish to thank uh, 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 
your uh, boss, uh, what call your chief of party, Dr. Uh, INL Cruz, uh, and also uh, your colleague, uh, Apsara Di Silva, and she was given tremendous support, and also uh, Melanie uh, Andrea Pereira. Uh, and also, uh, in this occasion, I wish to thank uh, the people of America and the USA, the, those who have donated us and give the technical and valuable support for this country. Uh, and also, uh, behind the scenes, uh, we have a lot of encouragement and uh, guidance uh, given by our president, uh, Engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri. We wish to thank him. And also, the president-elect, Professor Ranjit Disanayake, who was behind us and encouraged us. And also, not at least, not at last, our uh, uh, CEO, Engineer Neil uh, Abhisegra, and also his team, uh, especially Chamila, uh, Chandan and this, uh, 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 yeah, all the IT people and also uh, the people uh, 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 from the ISL staff. And also, we know uh, you are the strength for us, those who have participated for this event. I hope you get some uh, uh, knowledge about uh, the mediation and the importance of the mediation. So, wish to have another session. We will uh, in, invite you to have another uh, workshop type uh, in physical activity in future. We are planning to do it. And also, a uh, little, uh, little uh, small uh, request. Uh, she will be a little bit of time. She will accept our invitation to come here. So, thank, thank I will thank all the audience and uh, their valuable time with us. They are our strength. So, I will stop from here and I wish you the, have a nice weekend and uh, uh, happy you. Thanks.